Hey, beautiful people, it's Rakita, and I'm back with another video slash podcast. Don't forget, I'm going to have this on all the different podcasts. I haven't done it yet, but maybe you're listening to it right now. It's already on the podcast, but make sure you guys follow me on YouTube. Make sure you guys follow the podcast, and if you ever have any questions, definitely let me know. Now, in this video, you guys, I think this is like going to be the best one. I, I'm not saying that in terms of this is going to be a great conversation. I think you guys are going to learn so much from this, only because the person I have here, he actually does the real estate side and he does mortgages and it's good for us real estate agents to tell you to do this do that but this is the person that's actually going to help you get the money unless you have the money you can't get the house so you guys we have tyson reese here and he, like i said he does real estate and he does the mortgages so thank you so much tyson for coming to my podcast today oh thank you rakita for having me you're welcome you're welcome tell us a little bit about yourself like where are you from and who you help Okay, and, and no pressure with this being the best the best one. <laughs> <laughs> this will be the best Just, just a little bit. But um but no, uh, my name is Tyson Reeves. Um I do real estate. I'm a real estate broker here in Michigan and I uh, also do mortgages. Um I've been a real estate agent for or I say broker, but I'm used to saying agent. I've been a real estate agent for 16 years and I've also been a licensed mortgage officer for about 3 now. Okay. And, and let me correct that too, because a broker, you guys, I mean, he owns his own company, essentially, correct? Or you're I own working for company and I, yes. and I also uh, hire agents to work under me. Yeah. So he has the whole company. So just in case you get a little busy, you guys, it's somebody else that can definitely help you within his team. So that's really good. That means y'all got more backup, y'all. Think about it like that. You got more backup, <laughs> y'all. <laughs> more backup. So you actually does, you actually do the real estate and the mortgages. How do you like that doing both? So first of all, let me say I am a genuine uh, real estate person, mm -hmm. uh, but but as we know, as real estate people, we we we, we probably talk about mortgages more than we talk about houses yeah. uh, oftentimes. And I wasn't comfortable with that, even though I, I knew a lot about mortgages. So I thought anyway, I wasn't comfortable sharing that important information without having the real you know the real info not just the hands-on yes so i went and got um, my license and i learned so much after receiving that license just like with real estate you know you go through a class you start selling real estate it's nothing like the class right <laughs> yeah you know, we all we all have been through that uh mortgage is even more so that way because we we kind of learn mortgages by default as real estate people but we really don't have a clue as to what's going on with mortgages. And I found that out after uh, getting my license and started working in that field. OK, I know for sure it's a lot of questions I can have for you when it comes down to mortgages, because like you said, you as a real estate agent, you think, you know, until it's time to do the work and even know the numbers and everything that's going on with it. So you actually help. So when you get a client, you can help them actually get the loan and actually find the house also. Absolutely. Uh, I do that a lot. Okay. So uh, when it comes down to it, you can do that. I can do that for conventional loans. I can't do that for government based loans uh, such as FHA and BA. Okay. Uh, they don't allow the same person to work on both, but any of the conventional asset loans will allow that. Okay. So what happens is, is will a person will, will, Think about buying a house, think about selling, well, think about buying a house. They will have had that idea two, three years ago. Mm -hmm. They will have thought about moving when they first had a, a kid, but we, we have to move before they start school. That's five years later. That mm -hmm. idea will already be generating in, in, in their mind, you know, and, and as they get closer and years pass, like, yeah, we really need to move. You know, something happened around the corner. We got to get out of here, you know, and then they finally get to a point where, OK, we can do this. Let's let's call somebody who you call. Well, <laughs> there's this person um, or, or or Johnny had, you know, somebody that he used or something like that. Let's give him a call. We well, call the real estate person. And a, real, a lot of times and our industry fails with this. They'll say, go get pre-approved and call me back. Yeah. All right. Yeah. OK. I call the real estate person. Um, now I got to go get pre-approved. Oh, they gave me some phone number of some guy, you know, or. You know, a lot of a lot of us, my, myself included, as a real estate person, we're salespeople and we, we like to talk. We like to give info. So mm -hmm. we have a good conversation with the person, but then tell the person to go and call 
this person over here that's a complete stranger. Yeah. And when you call them, I want you to give them their, your social security number. They're going to pull your credit. You're going to give them all of your information. You're going to need your taxes. You're going to need your, your pay stubs, so forth and so on. You need to give your life to this stranger. There are so many people out there with debt, so much debt, you guys, that they can't even get a car. They can't get a mortgage. They can't even get a credit card. Like, I mean, a $200 credit card. Some people can't even get a secure credit card. So that's why I created my exclusive credit membership. And it's only a dollar, you guys. So my exclusive credit membership, you guys will actually get the letters to delete bankruptcies, charge off, repossessions. Any negative account that you have in your credit reports, I have the letter so you guys can get that deleted. But guess what? Just because you guys are a part of my exclusive membership, you can get all those letters. But say if you don't want to do all that work, I have it so that you guys can get free credit repair. So that means I will actually start working to help you remove these accounts from your credit reports. And look right here, look all the results that my clients are getting. So definitely remember, you guys can join my exclusive membership for just a dollar. And I'll have that link down below, or you guys can text SCORE21000 and you guys will have that link. So I'll see you guys in my exclusive membership. You know, um, what tends to happen is that a person is now ready. You know, they, they it's a big, it's a big thing, you know, getting ready to move and, and, and actually, especially not just move, but also purchase a, a house, you know, so they finally get the courage up or get themselves in a situation to do so. And they end up talking to a real estate person, which I recommend to do first, you know, talk to a real estate person. Okay. And when you say real estate person, do you mean like the realtor or the mortgage broker? Would you like to talk I, to the realtor first? It, what I believe Mm -hmm. is that people should talk to the real estate person first. Okay. Um, now, there could be some bias in that because I'm a real estate person first. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so I do have a little, but but my philosophy on that is that a lot of, and, I, and you know what, and it's kind of leading to the point I was making, is that sometimes the real estate agent or broker might tell the person to go get pre-approved and then they might go and wing trying to get pre-approved. I call it being winging it. What I mean is just going in to their bank or or just finding somebody online or, or going to Google, or maybe, you know, there is some big uh, mortgage person in the area, you know, that. Yeah. that, you know, is on the radio. They just call that person and of course they can get them pre-approved. But what happens is, is now, you know, you're, you're giving a lot more information to the mortgage person than you are the real estate person. Mm -hmm. You know, your, your critical information, mm -hmm. um, your social security number, your, your taxes, you know, how much you make a year, all these kind of things. And sometimes even a lot more personal, you know, divorce degrees, uh, child support, 401k, other, other retirement type of, of accounts and mm -hmm. things like that. And, and you're not talking to the person who you built this relationship or bond with. You know, you're not talking to the person that you see posting information online all the time. You're talking to a complete stranger giving critical information. Yeah, all of them. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and before I became a mortgage person, you know, and I'm talking, you know, years back too, mm -hmm. I always felt weird because me, it seemed like it's dark. Uh, me, you know, I have these conversations and I try to, you know, get to know uh, the person and everything. And at the end of the call, I'm always like, well, call this number and, you know, give this person all this information. And it just didn't sit right with me. And I felt like it might not sit right with my clients. Yes. So I decided to be that person. I decided to be the person that they're giving the information to the person that's pulling the credit and all those kind of things. So that they can feel comfortable knowing that, OK, I talked to one person, uh, I, I like them, you know, and I like them enough to, you know, I trust them. I should say I trust yeah, them yeah. enough to to give them my information. I, I really think that he'll help me. It's not some stranger, mm -hmm. you know, so that's that's where my my license came into play. OK, so because they already know me and I was like, hey, well, anybody else, I got you right here. We're going to do it all here. Yep. Okay, yep. perfect. And, and you don't have to. I, I, let, I let people know you do not have to use me as as a mortgage person in order to use me as your real estate person. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe people want to keep that separate 
or maybe they have they do know someone that's really good at it, you know, or maybe they have a family member that they trust already for the mortgages. Mm -hmm. So or maybe they want a lot. A lot of people like to use their banks that they have a relationship with. Um, What people a lot of people don't realize, though, is that you can bank with a a bank for however many years. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean they're going to be the right mortgage company for you. And it also doesn't mean that they're going to blend the two together. This person is banking over here. They keep their money over here. The mortgage is completely separate. Mm -hmm. It's completely separate. The most that they can do is possibly uh, look at your your bank statements for you. You know, they're the same company. You need bank statements when you're getting a a pre-approval. You know, the most that that company can do is look at the statements. Yes. And that's not that big of a deal. It's not. So what is your suggestion for people in terms of like credit score wise right now, just, to, you know, for the minimum? And then also we're going to talk about to even get the best rate, because those are two separate things. You guys, you know, you can get through the door. You could possibly get your mortgage, but you may not have the best rate because your credit score is low. And I always tell people, they say, well, how can I get a bigger house? Because I have a high credit score. Your credit score is only going to dictate your interest rate. Right. So. What is like the minimum credit scores right now to actually get like the VA, FHA, conventional loans? Okay. Now it's, it's, it's two parts. It's, it's two ways to answer that question. Mm-hmm. And I, wanna, I want to uh, be more personable with your audience mm-hmm. in answering that question. You know, there's the, you know, the, the to the letter by the law, you know, answer, you know, for that, which is uh, the minimum for FHA is, is 500. But in reality, it's 580. Mm-hmm. But in the real reality of things, <laughs> it's more around 640. You know, and, and the reason why I say it like that is because, yes, FHA will allow someone to have a 500 credit score and FHA will back the loan that the person get. However, finding a bank or a mortgage company to finance you when you have a 526 Good luck with that. Yes. You know, because there's so many, I, I believe, you know, I don't want to get in trouble with FHA or anything like that, but I believe they. Don't forget, you only need a 580 credit score to buy a home. Some people can go all the way down to a 500 credit score. So all I want you to do is go ahead and click that link for my home buying program and I'll help you step by step find a mortgage broker or find a bank to actually give you the money to get a loan and then I'll connect you with one of my partners in the United States. So I don't care where you at. I don't care if you're in Georgia, Texas, Florida, Wisconsin. I don't care where you at. You can even be in Cali. Go ahead and click that link and join my home buying program. Put those kind of things in place just to say that they they have it. Mm -hmm. They're not really trying to give it away, you know, because if because I think with with FHA and I say I think because like I've never done a loan with someone that had a 525 credit score, even Mm -hmm. though technically it's possible. Mm -hmm. But there's so many things in the way of that, that if you had all those things to get in the way, you wouldn't have a 525 credit score. True. (laughs) <laughs> if, if, if all of your stuff was caught up in all that and those kinds of things, you wouldn't have a score that way. You know, right. so it's just it's like one of those things. I think that's what it gets you at. Right. That's what it gets you at. And let's stay on the FHA before we go into the other um you okay. know, credit scores. Because when it comes down to FHA, you only you're only allowed to have so much debt. And a lot of times in terms of like collections, correct? Um collections are tricky and they're they're case by case. Okay. You know, there isn't, you don't want to have any collections, but some people do, okay. right? Um, it's, it's really case by case. And I don't really want to give like a, a general answer on that uh, because someone, you can, you can have collections and still be approved for, for loans. You can, mm-hmm. but it, it has to be looked at. And, and the underwriting of it is really going to go through it and see where you're, where you're at with that. Uh, sometimes what people will do is they'll open back up that account and start paying on an account and they didn't even really have to. Yeah. You know, so that's, that's one of those things. So like I said, I don't want it, but I don't want to tell people not to pay off, pay them off. Or I don't want to tell people to pay them off. So talk to a mortgage person first, maybe. So you think they Absolutely. should talk. So talk to your realtor. Have you talked to your realtor? Hey, I'm thinking about buying a house. Okay. 
and then go talk to someone actually does a mortgage and you guys can actually review the credit reports also correct if you allow us to pull it you know we, we okay. can pull the credit report and that would be the best way you know uh my recommendation is i mean people usually know if their credit isn't so high or if it needs to get you know pulled up and stuff like that and a lot of those people kind of stay away because they're like well i'm never going to get approved right now so i'm not going to talk to anybody mm -hmm. i'm just going to pay off what i can and they're going to see their their credit go up you know two points every every month or something they now they got 45 months to get to you know 100 you points higher or something you know you, you know what i mean so the the best thing to do is for someone that doesn't have great credit, you know, at the time, is you know either find someone like yourself, you know, and um, and have you look at it, or find a mortgage person that they that they trust to at least pull it and see what the mortgage is seeing. Okay. You know, because that can be different from uh, Experian and TransUnion and Equifax. I mean, it's not. I shouldn't say different what what we're looking at may be different than what is visible to you if you pull your own credit mm -hmm. like that so you know talk you know start talking to people start talking to, to to credit repair people and mortgage people and the mortgage person is definitely going to try to get your scores up to a certain extent okay you know and i'm like i said i just want to be you know open and honest too because mm -hmm. If you come to a mortgage person and your credit is say, you know, sub 600, the whole goal for the mortgage person is, well, if I get this person up, you know, help them out that way, they'll eventually purchase the house. They'll get a loan, purchase the house. But if it's, if it's so low that they can only give uh, general suggestions, the mortgage person also knows that's gonna take a while. Okay. And then, especially in a time like now, where you know there's, I'm looking over here in the corner because my, that's where my stuff is. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's so many people that you have to work with. Like right now, you might not get to the person that has a seriously low credit score. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but I think that's where where like a credit repair specialist can come in handy too. Mm -hmm. You know, get them to that point, and then you know maybe usher into the the mix the mortgage person yeah because my I always was told even from different mortgage companies they always told me hey try not to let them have more than two thousand dollars in collections and then two sometimes depending on those collections it, that, that it's different you know but two thousand dollars like the maximum like you cannot just have more than two thousand dollars in collections and then they also said too sometimes medical bills won't factor in especially if you don't have a lot now i've seen some people have like thirty forty thousand dollars in collections medical collections when you have that much that's a whole different conversation correct all yeah and bills. again all of that's going to be uh on a case-by-case -case basis even a two thousand because one of the person has a lot of credit and a high income then the 2000 and let me it, it kind of goes people people might think because you have a lot of money that you have great credit that's not always the case no. <laughs> you know you can have a lot of money and horrible credit mm -hmm. you know so a person with a lot of money can have two thousand dollars in collections or more or you know or less or whatever um but it's still going to be situational because you you mentioned like medical you know it, it mm -hmm. sometimes it depends on what those collections are how old they are you know different things like that as well so i'm reluctant to say that two thousand dollars is you know is a, is a base mark mm -hmm. um but that can be true though you know it, it can be true okay but you're not going to get me to to commit to that okay it is it's, everybody is different so usually when i see people credit I say okay aim for that mm -hmm. Especially when it comes down to even removing accounts, aim for that. And then I say, hey, talk to a mortgage specialist. And when you say, hey, it's still too much in collections, at least you can settle some debts, especially if you know what's what can be deleted, because maybe they just won't remove it. So that, I guess that is a great aiming target, correct? You think that you'll aim at that? Or what would you aim towards in terms of collections and charge offs? 
Oh my gosh, you guys, look at these results that one of my clients got just from opening a self account. Now this self account is amazing. So I have this account also, I paid $48 per month. And then after a year, they send me all my money back. But you know the best part, I'm saving money and then they're reporting to the credit bureaus, all three credit bureaus every month that I'm paying on time, which is really boosting my credit score, you guys. So definitely if you don't have a self account right now, it's a installment account, your credit score is really low, get that self account and you're gonna be so happy that you did it. The first thing I'm going to do is see how old they are. Okay. That, that's the most important thing because that's going to determine if there's even cause to get rid of it. Okay. You know, so that that's, that's first. Uh, now if, because once you open, once you make a payment or open that thing back up, now it's, it's looked at as new debt. Mm -hmm. You know, so let, let's say you had a collection for 700 bucks. You know, I want to get rid of this thing and I got 150 bucks. Once you pay that 150 bucks, now this is a new account, it's yes. not a new account, but it's, it's coming up as a uh, new activity. Real, yes, re-aged. Yes, it's, it's re-aged. That's a good word for it. And so now it's like, oh, you know, you have a collection that's new. You know, you you owe 150. I mean, you, got, you owe uh, uh, 500 bucks to this person now. You know, versus seven hundred bucks from two thousand and thirteen. So, what's and, the age? And, and, on and that, that weighs. It depends on the person's credit. It depends. So, what it really depends on is the worthiness that the underwriter sees. Okay. You know, that's that's not a textbook answer. Okay. But that's what a person is shooting for. That's what I'm shooting for. I'm trying to get this clean enough for the underwriters and at the same time not spending all of the person's money okay because i don't want to spend all of their money really they got a house to buy yeah so i want to get rid of as little as i possibly can but still satisfying the underwriters okay so it's a balancing act you know um there are some uh automated ways of of of, of doing things but when it comes down to to collections and things like that, the the auto, the automated processes don't like them. You know, the automated process doesn't like collections and all that kind of stuff. So now you have to start going in manually and saying, hey, I believe this person is good. And here's why. And here's okay. what we're doing and things like that. OK, so you might have seen um, older movies or whole, heard stories about people going, especially, you know, with black people and stuff, you know, people going to the bank and talking to the banker, trying to get a loan. Mm -hmm. And today, you know, a lot of it is, is automated, but you still do have a percentage of that still going on. Okay. Uh, and it's, it's called manual underwriting. You still do have where you actually talking to somebody and having them approve or not approve you for, for a loan. Yes, I heard of it, and they usually say it's at a certain credit score because you can go through what is it? It's a system that can um, push you through underwriting. I think if you have, at least have it like a 640 a lot of time for like FHA or something. I'm not, I'm not sure. That's why we're here. <laughs> but right. it's a, a system that can push you through. But if your credit score is low, if there's certain factors, then the person that's actually doing your mortgage, they can do like a man, um, they can request a right. manual underwriting, which you can, I guess you can include in certain things or talk about certain things on why you should still get the loan and they can possibly push it through. You get it. And that's called direct underwriting. Okay. The, the system that you were talking about. Oh, direct underwriting. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what that system is called. And that's what we use probably 90% of the time. Okay. Right. But there are, like I said, there are those like, you know, borderline uh, situations to where direct underwriting won't approve a person, but you still think that you can, they'll be worthy. Yes. You know, and, and usually you're talking about, like you said, certain credit scores, certain things on the credit, you know, and things like that to where if, if it's if it's automated, there is some somewhere someone put in the system. Uh, if then code. Right. You know, if the person has this score and this, then approve them. You know, if the person doesn't, then don't approve them. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's all it knows. You know, it's, it's reading the information that it gets and it's saying yes or no. You know, far more complicated than that, obviously, right? But that's what's going on. That's that's direct underwriting. 
How long does it take? So after you get a well, let's kind of talk about the minimum credit scores, and I'll talk about that. What's the minimum credit scores for um, a VA and also a conventional? And then what's your suggestions on where they should actually be at to get those type of loans? So VA is very, very similar in this aspect to to FHA. Mm -hmm. um, FHA goes a little bit lower, you know, getting down to five hundred, but really not really, like I said. Um, so 580 is the quote unquote true minimum, okay. but that's only for FHA and VA who are not lenders. Um, FHA and VA are lenders. They guarantee the money in case of a default. Okay. So, so basically at the, gov the government FHA or HUD is saying that, hey, I'm going to use this name just because everyone knows it. Hey, Bank of America, if you lend this person money, we will insure it because they met this criteria. OK, so if, if they default and don't pay you, we'll pay you a certain percentage of that money. OK, VA does the same thing. There is a guarantee to the lender that if this person, hey, this is this is a this is a veteran. You know, we're going to allow these liberties to this person if they don't. Uh, you know, follow through, then we'll give you a portion of, of your money back for this loan. Okay. So they are not lenders. They just have a, a set standard that says to the lender that if you lend this person money, we got your back. And that's why they have like a set um, credit score minimum requirement. But if you go to certain banks, they'll say, hey, I know the minimum you thinking of is 580, but our bank requires this. A six, usually a six forty. Okay. If, if if you're dealing with a six forty, you can probably get a loan as long as you don't have any crazy stuff on your report. And that's to get out of. Is that the to get out of the direct underwriting too? Is that what it was called again? So with well, I don't. You know what? Too. I also don't want to get too technical. Okay. You know, because I don't want to confuse people. You know, about all these different things. Like they're like they're going to get a license or something. <laughs> you know. They, they want to get a loan. They don't, you know, the well, sometimes, sometimes I realize people, you can go talk to certain mortgage companies and I even brought up certain things like, Hey, if you get an FHA, they won't allow you to have certain credits. And if you have money left over, you're not going to get that money back. So I recently with a buyer, I have to tell the mortgage person like, Hey, what are you, you can't do it this way. We got to, you know, we got to switch some stuff over. And on top of that, let's not pay, let's not buy down the points. Let's not do this. I want people to know that stuff so that if it was to come up if it, they can say something or they'll know kind of what's going on i don't want them to hear it first time from somebody else i would rather them hear from us and it's like oh i heard that before where did i hear that at? okay i remember I mean, I, 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 the reason why i love what you just said well you you are you are a broker so so i know you you probably probably come from the same part of the brain with, with, with what you just said and i probably do but the reason why i love what you just said as far as hearing it before Mm -hmm. Is because when I when I'm when I'm the real when I'm a salesperson as a real estate broker, and I have my first um, visit with with the person, you know, we're finally going to see a house or something on the first house. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually a lengthy conversation. I, I, we we pull up to the house. I tell them what it is that I'm going to be looking at at every house that we go see, and what they should be looking for. And I tell them not to worry about it, though. I'm looking for everything, but I just want you to know what's really going on. And mm -hmm. um, and usually I start outside with the foundation of the house and the roof, right? And I tell them that every single house that I'm pulling up to, I'm going to be looking at the roof. I'm going to be looking at the foundation. I'm pointing out, you know, what I'm looking for. But also, we're going through the entire process. And I tell them at some point, I say, I know you're not going to remember all of this, but as we go through the process, I want you to have a reference to this conversation to where we are at that time yes you know so when when you said you know i want them to be able to say i heard that before like that's exactly what i want them to uh to to think too yeah because some people uh, don't even know that you know they can credit collection companies how long they'll stay on your credit reports some people don't even know where to get their credit reports so if we the first one to say it we spark something in their mind and that's that's the start that's really the start yeah, but as far as minimum credit scores, uh, in reality, so it, over the years, the minimum has gone up. I remember when it used to be a 620, 
<laughs> then it was a 640. Right now, you really want a 660. Well, you really want a 740. But that's that's the second part of the conversation. Uh, but the minimum, you know, 660 is kind of where you want to start at if you can get there. Okay. Uh, not that you can't get a loan, especially FHA, especially VA, you know, at uh at a 640, even a 620 is, is, is possible. Um, 660, you're kind of in there, you know, as long as there's no ugly stuff, you know, anywhere on your credit report. And, um, you know, you can get the loan. However, if, if it's okay with you to go further. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm sorry. The minimum is good for, I need to buy a house. I'm increasing my uh, my score so we can move we need to move and things like that if but not everyone has a low credit score you know one of the things that i that i realized uh some time ago in my business even before i was a mortgage person you, just, you know i was you know still a, a just a, a real estate broker is that you always hear about you know the lowest thing you know doesn't matter what your credit score is, mm-hmm. just out of bankruptcy. But it's plenty of people who, you know, have average to good credit that also need help too. Mm-hmm. That that realize that yeah, we're over seven and that's good and everything. But how do I get to seven forty? How do I get to seven sixty? And there's also people like me. I have been stuck at around seven ninety for years and like do i need better credit no not really but everybody knows that's ever been 780 790 Mm -hmm. 799 you want to cross that street yeah it's like it's right (laughs) and you can't because your credit doesn't move up there like you well anyway i'm not a credit specialist but you know just being a regular person like your credit just stops like no matter what you do, you can't get it over like jump. Over hump. <laughs> yeah, you know, so so there and there's a lot of people, you know, that are there, but no one no one talks to them. Okay. You know, no no one seems to talk to I should say them, us. No one no one talks to us. You know, and I, I think, you know, that if you do have six sixty, six eighty, if you got if you seven hundred is the same way as eight hundred. If if you have a, a six ninety, which a lot of people do have 680, 690, like how do I get to that 700? I want that 700, you know? And there's a lot of people in, in, in that range, you know? Yeah, and, and that, thinking about that, one of my biggest questions is when a client is at the, like the 680, um, 690, 700, and they really want to get over that 740 so that they can get a great interest rate, would it be wrong if they get added as an authorized user on someone else's credit reports? Would you guys frown upon that? I have not seen it frowned upon. Uh, now, you know, I think a person does have to be careful, okay. you know, because one thing that people don't mention is that if, if you're an authorized user and the person that authorized you on, on their credit, if they do something bad, that's on you, too. Yeah, we talk about you know, that a lot. <laughs> plus, too. If this person has a lot of credit, you know, and and they allow you to be on their card and I don't know, say the card is ten, twelve thousand dollars, but they have one hundred thousand dollars in credit or more and they go use their credit somewhat. So, you know, they use three or four percent of their credit. It's like 40 percent of your credit. Yes. You know, <laughs> but, so, if it, so. but if it's a good account, though, in terms of maybe they're not using this card, they're adding, adding you as an authorized user, and it's going to boost your credit score over that 640 like you want because it has the age mm-hmm. that's what people really need. You need the, the age, age yeah. to get your credit score really high. Then you guys won't frown upon it and it won't look it won't be looked at in a bad way if it's done correctly because sometimes people say authorized users is bad authorized users or like trade lines and things like that don't do that at all because you're going to not get a mortgage because of that account is that true i haven't i have not seen that backfire on someone in the sense of everything is clean okay um so i will have to answer that question as not true okay but i do think that you know a person has to be careful okay because 
again, you know, anything that that person does with, with that card, if, if they forget a payment, you know, if they forget and, and it's a late payment, now that's a 30 day late on, on you and 30 day lates are frowned upon. Yes. You know, so you just have to be, you know, and yeah, the person had people with good credit make mistakes too, mm-hmm. you know, and also like I was saying in, in the beginning, the, the utilization. So if this person makes a large, they go on a trip, you know, they spend $3,000 on this trip and it was really nothing to them. Cause they got but, a of credit. Yeah. Yeah. But now they get, uh, I want to, I want to use a real number, uh, $3,000. Maybe that payment is something like, um, 250 bucks a month. Okay. But now you have on your credit, uh, a line that says that you are paying $250 a month. Oh, that's a different angle. Yeah. So now that's coming off of your debt to income ratio. So authorized, even if you're an authorized user, you guys want to use that for debt to in- income ratio purposes. You guys are still going to use that as their debt, even if you're just an authorized user. Yeah, that's their debt. I mean, it's not, it's not oh. their debt per se, but it's showing up on their credit as a credit that is in there. So when, when, when we pull a credit, there's going to be lines of, of things, mm-hmm. your car, you know, whatever, all the things that you have credit for, all your cards, school, everything. Right. So one, that's going to be one of those lines that you have this credit and there's a payment of two hundred and fifty dollars, If you know, in this, in this scenario. Oh. So if you only make so much money and you're doing pretty good and you have this line that says two hundred fifty dollars, like, shoot, you know, I, I have to credit that. Now, there are ways, you know, around it. You know, if, if there's a line on your credit and it's going to be paid off. I can mark it as to be paid and, is and that, be able to. Is it a year for that too? What's the deadline no. for that debt? No, uh, I mean, it, it, really, it really depends. No, there's it's not a, a deadline or, or a timing. It's when we pull the credit report, this was on there, mm-hmm. right? Uh, if that changes, because we're going to look at the credit again, you know, once you get through the process, if that's gone, it's gone, great. Or if you can say, hey, this is the situation, um, because you, you can talk to the mortgage person, you know, it's mm-hmm. like, you can talk to the real estate person. Like you said, in the beginning, we're all just people. Yeah. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the mortgage person doesn't have say so over if your, your loan is approved or not. And the mortgage person wants your loan approved because that's how we get paid. Mm-hmm. Right. So we're going to advise you, you know, the best things to do, you know, so let, let us know. So, hey, you know, this is my credit, you know, um, I'm an authorized user. This is, say, my brother's thing, you know, he's going to pay that off and everything. I can I can calculate the paid off portion of that of that. It'll be verified later when we're getting ready to close. Oh, that's what I'm saying. Uh, it has to really be paid off within the time of closing almost, correct? Well, yeah, because you have to see that it, you know, so what happens is, is you're pre-approved or you're approved. And then when it goes through the underwriting, they're going to look at everything again to make sure that not, that that's why you're not supposed to go out and buy furniture or put anything on your credit and all that kind of stuff while you're in escrow. And you know, that's usually the soft pull, like um, usually three days before closing or the day of closing. That's the soft pull on their credit. It's, it's a soft pull. And yeah, it depends. Uh, it depends upon like how the process is going, really. Okay. You know, um, how quickly it's going to be, you know, this is definitely in order to get to clear to close. Okay. Um, clear to close is a term that we use in the real estate and mortgage uh, background. Uh, anyone that's bought a house have definitely heard the word clear to close. But those who haven't, uh, clear to close means that everything is done. We're ready to send the money. Okay. So in order to get to clear to close, that soft pull is going to be taking place to make sure that the buyer hasn't done anything that they weren't supposed to do. Yes. <laughs> so, and that, and that's why realtors and mortgage people always like, look, don't use none of your credit, you yes. know, for, until, until we close this freaking house. 
So I hear that a lot. And a lot of people get scared too when I say, hey, they're going to give you a hard pull when you first apply to get a mortgage, but they're going to pull your credit again, but it's going to be a soft pull. And they're like, <sighs> why? They want to see what you've been doing because sometimes people go get a card, they get credit cards, they max out credit cards, mm -hmm. they do all types of things that would mess up the loan. So that's why I tell people you are going to get that soft pull. And it's usually... Yeah the day of closing or the three days before closing when when does that it's, happen well it's going to be at least three days before closing because um we have this process called trid that says that you have to at least start getting your final numbers within three to five days before the actual close mm -hmm. so therefore in order to get the final numbers you have to have what's called a clear to close and in order to get the clear to close uh, the underwriter has to say, hey, yep, everything is fine. We're good to go. Okay. And, and that's what that's soft pull. So it's going to be at least three or four days, be, at, at the minimum three or four days, but it could be a week ahead of time. It could be two weeks ahead of time. Okay. Um, as a matter of fact, it's even better if it's, if it's sooner because that means that things are going real smoothly. You know, okay. the whole process is going, it's flowing, and it didn't take 30 or 35 days to get to that point. You know, it only took three weeks maybe, you know, to get to the point where, hey, we're ready. Whenever you guys are ready, we're ready. You know, that, that's that's what clear to close means. Okay, how long does it typically take right now for, um, how long does it typically take for clients to close? The escrow, well, here in Michigan, I, I should say that, um, the escrow process in Michigan eh, is on average 30 to 35 days. Okay. Uh, when I write my offers, I build in a, uh, a closing date of about 35 days. Mm -hmm. And that way, you know, I'm not pushing the 30 days, you know, if, in case it gets a little bit hairy, but we can always close early. Okay. You know, you can always close early if everything goes good. Um, but 30, 35 days, sometimes 45 days, depends upon the type of loan. Okay. And tell us a little bit too about, um, I know this is kind of, you know, I know it's a lot of information, everybody, but I kind of want to get into after you help clients um, get their pre approval. How long does it take for you after you actually um, find the house to get all the documents signed? How long does it typically take for you guys to go and get like the appraisal ordered? Because I know we having a big problem right now with appraisals for to get it ordered uh -huh. and then for them to actually come out. Are you guys having a big problem with that with appraisals? We are right now. Um, and it it's almost a little bit refreshing to hear that uh, we're not the only ones. Yeah, uh, no. You're, you're having a <laughs> but um, for us, the process, the process of buying a house, right? You you finally you finally going to do it, and you're ready, and all all is good. I tell people that expect about three months total. Now, I just did one and, and the, the guy, he, he kind of bragged about it. So I got the number from him. He <laughs> said, from the day I called you, it took me 42 days to uh, to be in my house. Wow, a month and a half. Yeah, and, that, and that's the entire process. That, that was When he called me, he told me that he wanted to buy a house. The first He told me he was ready. The first thing I did was I got him pre-approved, right? So from, from, from he's, he's talking about from the time that he called me, to get pre-approved, to find a house, to get an offer accepted, to go through the full escrow of inspection, appraisal, underwriting, clear to close. All of that took 42 days. Um, the, the real estate part, and, and that's also building in 35 days. Mm -hmm. now, like I said, I built in 35 days from the time that we write this offer and get it accepted to actually close. So, and to tell the truth, if I'm really being honest, it also built in the fact that he went out of town for the 4th of July because this this happened. This was happening around oh. the 4th of July. So he he went out of town that weekend and came back. So it, and that was within that 42 days as well. So if we were shaving off those days, he was gone for about three or four days. It would be even even less. So it can happen very fast. And I want to say this that can also be scary for a lot of people. Yes. Because that is moving fast. Um, and you don't really want to be rushed and you want time to, to, to think about things, you know? So I used to tell people that expect about three months because 
there's another aspect that doesn't get talked about a lot. And that is the fact that now there aren't a lot of foreclosures and vacant houses. So you're probably buying a house from someone that lives in that house. So when, when that happens, you may have a, a possession, a occupancy period. And what that is, is when they're saying that if you buy this house from us, we want you to know that we need to be here 30 days. Mm-hmm. We need to be here 15 days after closing. If they haven't found a house, they might even say, we need to be here between 45 and 60 days after mm-hmm. we close. So a lot, that's a whole topic by itself. Yes. Uh, but that's something that people don't talk about a lot. You, you don't hear that often until you're in the process. Um, and so you're, you're buying this house. You think you're going to call, you're going to close, right? But then you can't move in. Well, now someone's living in your house. Maybe, maybe they're going to pay you a rent for the days that they're going to, they're going to be in there. That's normal. However, with the way the market, the markets are right now, that's one of the first things that's used as an incentive for your offer to be accepted. Is waiving the uh, waiving the fee for occupancy. Oh wow! That's one of the first things to go because it's the simplest, it's the easiest. Um, so excuse me. Um, so you know, we go through the entire process. I even talk about that. You know, a lot of times people are leasing, so that can really be a big hindrance to the point that I need to be out of here by October thirty first. So now I must find a house that I can move into when I close. Mm-hmm. So now when I'm setting up your searches for, you know, for your houses to be seen, I got to say, OK, um, we can only see houses that have immediate immediate possession. OK, so that's going to that's going to eliminate a lot of houses. Yes. You know, so it's good to start about three months ahead of time if, if that's your situation, because you don't want to limit your houses. You want to be able to look at all of the houses. And if I have to build in this 30 days. Okay. Okay. I like that. I like the three month idea because anything can happen. And, and like you said, too, even if you get under contract, if you if you um able to close early, you can close early. It's just closing later is the problem when you're under contract. But I always ask everyone, I always say, name a situation where you were helping a buyer and something happened where they were not able to close, but you came in and you saved the day whatever that situation may be. And you on both sides with being a realtor or actually being, a, well, let's we can call it realtor for terms, being a realtor and also being the mortgage company. Name a situation where somebody messed up, some, something happened, but you came and saved the day and now they closed. Oh my goodness. Uh, you realize you're talking to a realtor, right? <laughs> <laughs> we have so many of those situations. As a matter of fact, that's the biggest part of our job is to make sure that everything stays the way it's supposed to stay. And when it gets out of hand to pull it back in, um, name one though, recently I helped a client buy pretty nice house. This is a pretty nice house and they had not so great credit to begin with. Mm -hmm. Um, they went to, a credit specialist that didn't know what they were doing, you know, and he was able to remove some things and, you know, stuff like that. And they thought everything was great. Um, they, the, the, my client, they went with the loan officer that the credit specialist said that they should, because they had some kind of a thing going on. Mm-hmm. And I said, Hmm. Okay. You know, uh, that's fine, but you should let me do this because, because we, so we can verify that the credit person is good. And the person that he's sending you to isn't just some, you know, they work together on something Mm -hmm. anyway. He said, nah, you know, this is what they do. And like I said, like I told you earlier, I don't make people use me for one service or the other, you know, and plus yes, two, it's against the law to, to enforce that anyway. You know, I have to say, hey, you can use whatever you want to use. Uh, so they did that. But down the line, 
we eventually find a house and they're they qualified FHA at first. Um, and we were looking in um, at homes that typically aren't FHA. Uh, these homes here in Michigan, this, is, this home was about three hundred and sixty thousand mm-hmm. dollars. And that's not really an FHA market here in Michigan. Uh, that's more of a conventional market. Uh, conventional people typically have higher credit scores. They typically have higher down payments and things like that. So now they're competing against uh, people with more money and better credit, you know, with an FHA versus a conventional. Uh, a lot of, of sellers look at a conventional versus FHA and automatically pick conventional. Anyway, they were approved FHA. We go out, we're looking, we're looking, we're looking, we're putting offering after offer, and they're not getting anything. Uh, they took a little bit of time off. Their credit score kind of started to go up kind of naturally. Yes. And the loan officer said, okay, you're conventional now. Sweet. You know? Yeah. So yeah. we go out, we find we find this house. We start getting into the, the, the swing of things and underwriting is like, no, you're not. You know, we can't qualify you conventional, but we still can qualify you FHA. Right? Okay. You know, I, I go back and forth with the uh, with, with their loan officer trying to see what we can do because we're under contract now. Can't we're you see this, a, a lot of my clients right now in this market, I say, hey, get approved for the conventional, but you can always switch your loan to the FHA if you need to. Because I have somebody actually that's closing Thursday that just did that same exact thing and have a, a lower down payment and actually a better interest rate. So couldn't they switch? They so so they got accepted because the loan officer said they were conventional, right? So now we have to switch, even though we're in the process of buying this house. We have to switch now back to FHA because the underwriter said that they can't do conventional. Okay. They can only do FHA. So we have to switch. Mm-hmm. However, if you, you have a contract with this seller, the terms of your loan is built into that contract. If you switch without the consent of the seller, or well, you're going to have to have the consent of the seller to switch any of the terms within that contract or you're breaching the contract. And there, and and now the seller can say, "Hey, this person switched terms. It's a hot market. I'm gonna put my house back on the market. See what I can get." It depends on your contract. Everybody's contract is different. I know we right. had a clause that was built in. If I, if for some reason, my um, financing failed, I'm able to get whatever financing that's available. And if that fails, huh. you have an option to finance me yourself, or I'm able to get out the deal. That's that's a good clause. Because in in their situation, we there was nothing like that. <laughs> oh my because God. they they were qualified to be to be at, uh, conventional. Oh wow! You know, at this point, what happened? What happened? <laughs> oh my God! So they didn't understand the fight. You you probably understand being a, a a real a real estate person. The fight it was for me to hold on to that seller. My client is the buyer. Another agent has a client as you know the seller. The seller got their own agent. That's, yeah, that's everybody has their own agent and stuff, mm-hmm. you know, and, and you need it to be that way. You, you need to have your own agent, you know, and things like that. But so now I'm fighting to Pinnell to get them to agree to 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 accepting FHA. Like, we're you know, we're already under contract. We, we've already did the inspection and appraisal and all that kind of stuff. We can close if you allow this to happen now. I mean, the, 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 let me let me get to the back of this story. I was saying, um, did they end up did they end up accepting <laughs> it? Like, what happened? Did they, did they well, the question the question was a situation that was that was kind of hairy that I ended up saving. Yeah. So so yes, we ended up buying this house with FHA though. With the FHA loan. So the sellers agreed to it. Eventually. Eventually, well, a lot of talking and a lot of convincing. Oh, what a what a ton of it! Because the this loan officer was so bad, and I don't I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but in the situation, the loan officer was so bad that every angle was was a fight. Because the first time he the first time he approved them, it was FHA. However, they had a house already that that they had an FHA loan under, so this will be the second FHA. Mm-hmm. And 
that is possible under certain circumstances. Okay. But he never briefed them on those circumstances. Oh. Right. And I even uh, waved the flag. I said, hey, you know, you're FHA, but you have this FHA. And, you know, I, I, what I didn't do was tell the loan officer that I'm also a loan officer, too. Mm -hmm. I just didn't want to get into that with him. Uh, but me knowing the laws and things like that, you know, I know what's going on. I, I can see what's going on. So, I, but I told them, I said, "Hey, you have an FHA, you know, and and this is this is what's up when you have one trying to get another one, you know." And they were trying to hold on to the house. It wasn't like they were selling it, selling it, and closing. They're going to end up with two with two mortgages, two FHA mortgages. So how did I they? Them, I waved this flag. Hmm? How did they end up closing two? So what happened was, was this, that was before we actually found the house, right? They were FHA. We couldn't find anything. I, I said, Hey, you know, talk to the loan officer. The loan officer said, no, it's going to be fine. It's going to be great. But we never found a house while they were FHA. We went conventional. Didn't matter that they, they had an FHA house already because they could afford that house and this house mm -hmm. because that, that house was bought back in like 2013 during the crash. And it was small. It was like $40,000 on it. It wasn't a heavy loan, but it was a loan. Uh, so we flip back to FHA, right? Now we're in the middle of the deal and we flip back to, we're trying to flip back to FHA. I'm basically begging and pleading this other agent to talk to their their uh, their their person, you know, to accept this thing. But this was in the summer and the prices continue to go up. Even while we're in escrow, the prices are going up. You go, I don't remember what oh. day or month it was, but I think it was like April or something. And what we got that price at, 30 days later, that price is worth more already. So they are. So the seller's like, hey, there is a problem. Um, we don't want y'all. We about to put the house back on the market and find somebody else. That's going to be conventional. There ain't going to be no problem. And we're going to make more money. I like so, that you can close it out, though. That's the best part. They that's the best part. Happy. But the, the sellers was like, well, we want seven more thousand dollars. I was like, no, I didn't even go back to the uh, I didn't even go back to my buyer before I said no to that agent about the seven thousand dollars. You know, I, I, I talked I talked to the, the other agent like, you know, we want the house. We're ready. We're not coming up seven thousand dollars for you. Um, she eventually went and talked to her seller about that, and they came back and said, "Okay, that's fine, but you know, A, B, C, D." And um, so that was one hurdle that I kind of got past. But now, going back to the loan officer, hey, we're good, we're ready to go, we got this. This is what we need. Loan officer was like, fine. He sent it up the ladder. They came back and said, hey, that, that other house that, that they have, we need a physical appraisal on that house. And the reason why that is, is because FHA, in order to have two FHA loans, they need to mark that the house has at least 25% equity in it. Okay. It absolutely does. I mean, it has... I mean, a ton of, of equity in it because they, when they bought it, it was during the market crash years ago. And now everything is up. up, uh, up. But <laughs> what they wouldn't allow was for it to be just a, um, you know, we know that the house is worth more than this amount kind of a thing and mm -hmm. sign it off. They still need a physical appraisal. Well, you asked me about timing of appraisals and all that kind of stuff a little bit early. I never a answered the question, actually. But. We don't have enough appraisers, and that's the reason why appraisers take a long time. Everybody knows that. So now needing a physical appraisal means that this thing can be delayed another two, three weeks. Right. So now I got to go back to the uh, this agent. And it's like, hey, remember, you know, you said, yeah, we can close the house. And now we got to wait for an appraisal to be done on another house. You know, so what that looks like from the seller's aspect, we don't as as a, as the seller, I don't know if your house is going to appraise for for the amount or not. You know, so how long did it take to close this all together? It took about two months altogether because we were we we were from escrow. It usually take 30, 35 days, and it ended up being about two full months. And that last month was me putting out fires 
from that loan officer. I bet. I yep. bet it was a lot of fire. And, and they were still scared. The, the, the client was still scared because that throughout the entire process, I'm like, switch. Like, you know, screw, screw them, switch. And, you know, even if you don't use me, use a different, you know, loan person. But they were kind of, in my opinion, you know, they never said these words, but in my opinion, they were afraid to go away from this particular mortgage person because the, he was connected to the person that kind of raised their score. Oh, okay. Because they had that connection. I see what you're saying. Right. So, yeah, you know, but the thing is, though, they're not all that crazy. Um, oftentimes, just things happen. You know, um, stuff like inspections. You know, we didn't talk about inspections today, but yeah, you know, we talked about inspections on a realtor end, though. I talked okay. about that plenty of times about like inspections okay, and how they work. Yeah. Well, you know, the inspection can throw a monkey wrench into the whole mix too, mm -hmm. uh, good or bad. You know, sometimes the house is just a bad house. You, you can't tell until the person starts crawling through the crawl spaces and attic and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. um, you know, and that can just end the deal. But also, you know, you can get hemmed up on the person, you know, this is this is not to my liking. It's going to be an appraisal issue. And the seller is like, we're not doing nothing. You know, uh, yeah, you know, that that can end up being so as as a realtor, you're like, you know, as a realtor, you're always like, how do I marry these two sides? You know, I, I know what what we want and I know what I'm fighting for, but also where is the middle ground between what we want and what the seller is willing to do? And sometimes it's nice and friendly. And sometimes it's, it's like, OK, if you're not doing this, we're walking. Yeah, we you know? had a whole discussion on in, um, the inspections on, hey, it's probably time for you to walk away. Mm -hmm. or, hey, the seller will fix something. Or, hey, them credits that you thought you were going to get is not going to actually go towards what you want to get fixed because sometimes they won't let you escrow it, depending on what the thing is. Because mm -hmm. they deem it as this is just too much for you to even get this property. Is this property up to par to get a loan on it? Oh yeah, that too. Yeah. yeah. The inspections is like a, it's a, it's like the wild west when it comes down to inspections, but I always tell people, I know you're not, you're not required to get one, but to me, I always say you, you almost required. If you want to make sure you have a secure home and you know what you're getting yourself into, get that inspection for sure. And go through that process because that's like, Inspections is, is necessary and people think I don't want to spend extra money, spend it. Really spend the extra money. There are so many people out there with debt, so much debt, you guys, that they can't even get a car, they can't get a mortgage, they can't even get a credit card. Like, I mean, a $200 credit card. Some people can't even get a secure credit card. So that's why I created my exclusive credit membership and it's only a dollar, you guys. So my exclusive credit membership, you guys will actually get the letters to delete bankruptcies, charge off, repossessions, any negative account that you have in your credit reports, I have the letter so you guys can get that deleted. But guess what? Just because you guys are a part of my exclusive membership, you can get all those letters, but say if you don't want to do all that work, I have it so that you guys can get free credit repair. So that means I will actually start working to help you remove these accounts from your credit reports. And look right here, look all the results that my clients are getting. So definitely remember, you guys can join my exclusive membership for just a dollar. And I'll have that link down below, or you guys can text SCORE21000 and you guys will have that link. So I'll see you guys in my exclusive membership.